Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. My name is uh, Lorenzo Iamone. I'm a senior lecturer in robotics at the Queen Mary University of London. And this is uh, uh, Queen Mary X Research Week. And uh, in this hour, we will uh, introduce the research we do in uh, robotics. Uh, I will give just a couple of uh, quick information for all the attendees uh, in case you, uh, you haven't joined uh, a Zoom webinar before. So you have a couple of buttons that you can use to interact with us. You have a Q&A uh, button that you can use to pose questions related to our presentations. And then you have a chat button that you can use to uh, pose questions related to any technical issue you will have, for example, if you are not seeing our videos or anything else you want to share. And I'm uh, showing the uh, schedule of today. So we will have a first in uh, quick introduction, then a first block of presentations, and then a, a question and answer session, then another block of presentation, and then another question and answer session. But I will encourage uh, everyone to just type questions in the Q&A uh, in the Q&A chat in the Q&A session section, uh, even uh, during uh, our videos, so that we can have questions there, and then during the Q&A session we can we can answer them. And I will stop sharing my screen now, and I will leave it to to Kaspar to uh, to introduce the robotics group. Yep, thank you very much, Lorenzo. And I hope I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see my screen? Okay, good. Yeah, so welcome to the robotics um, seminar, which is part of the uh, EX Research Week. And uh, we are ARC the Center for Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary. ARC is part of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. It is actually situated in two schools, the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science, as well as the School of Engineering and Materials Science. But we are not only um, see ourselves as people working in engineering and computer science, but we also extend to other areas uh, such as medicine and biology. And so we are very cross faculty, multidisciplinary. Four years ago, we started and um, we have already 15 faculty members within our group and more than 50 research associates and PhD students. Um, I should say we are very research active and have acquired around 3 million pounds of research grants within the last three years. And uh, I should also highlight that we have a very successful undergraduate uh, program in robotics engineering, as well an MS, as, a, as an MSc program called Advanced Robotics. Um, already 60 students studying uh, robotics at Queen Mary. Um, today we will give a, a short overview of our work and really show you some of the highlights, but there's of course much more happening in the Center for Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary. And so please do visit our website where you can find out more about um, that work. I just would like to bring that to your attention. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud that through our concerted effort within the, the center, we were able to bring the International Conference on Robotics and Automation to London. And that will happen in 2023. And I should really highlight that is the first time that this most prestigious robotics conference comes to the UK. And uh, yeah, I give back to Lorenzo. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Kaspar. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so now we will go through the first uh, block of presentations. These are uh, pre-recorded presentations, actually, that we, uh, we pre-recorded a couple of days ago. And uh, we, will, uh, we will show you a few of them, and then we will have some question and answer. So again, I encourage you to type your questions uh, so that we can answer them later on. So we share my screen again. Hello. 
My name is Kaspar Althöfer, and today I want to present perception in soft robots. Intelligent and autonomous robots need to sense in order to be able to act. And this has been successfully applied in these robots that we can see here in the background, rigid component robots operating in a manufacturing environment. These are equipped with sensors to measure the interaction with the environment. So for example, force sensors are being used. They're integrated at the tip of these robots. And this allows these robots to actually sense the interaction, the physical interaction with the environment. And these are rigid component sensors for rigid component robots. However, if we now want to apply similar sensing capabilities to these kind of soft robots that I'm showing in these videos, then we need to find other types of sensors that can be integrated with those soft robotic devices without disturbing their softness. So we really need soft sensors. There are a number of sensors that have been developed and these are just some examples. Um, and you may want to have a, a look later at this slide um, for uh, and, and go look at further details. However, I would like to focus on the approach that we are taking here and we are using an optics based approach for tactile and post sensing in soft robots. This work um, relates to um, work we have done started maybe 10 years ago and the idea is to measure light intensity variations due to forces being applied to the formable structure. And this allows us now to relate the light intensity measured to the forces applied. And in this way, we can appreciate the forces applied to different kinds of structures. We have, for example, implemented this technology into structures like these. So this is a cardiac catheter that allows us then to measure forces inside of the heart. This particular um, sensor has now three of these um, light intensity force sensor um, sensors built in that allows us to measure forces along the three axes. So whenever forces are applied in X, Y and Z direction, we can measure that with this uh, device. We have also uh, used the same technology, the fiber optics based approach and integrated that with soft structures like this one here. As you can see, the structure is moving about and we can visualize it using the light intensity approach. Now moving a step further, we have um, used here transparent silicon to guide the light. And this allows us now to create sensors that are absolutely soft and stretchable and suitable to be integrated with soft silicon structures like this soft finger that we are showing here. And when we now actuate this finger, when it starts bending, our light guides, wave guides integrated can now um, be used to estimate the shape or the bending of this finger. Similarly, we have integrated that into this black um, soft finger if you want. And whenever we apply pressure, the integrated waveguides can uh, respond to that and the signal can be interpreted to measure the applied pressure. Similarly, we can now use these integrated waveguides to measure the amount of bending. I would like to thank my collaborators, my sponsors, and you for listening. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Kaspar Althöfer and I'm the head of the Center for Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary. In my presentation today, I would like to present um, eversion robots and these are inflatable robots that can be used to reach, reach inaccessible spaces. And I would like to make the point that these robots could be also used to help persons that are trapped in a disaster situation. And in this context, I would like to show the work by Satoshi Tatokori, who has worked in this area for quite some time. And here are just some images to show what really can happen um, if an earthquake, for example, strikes. And people can be trapped in these uh, difficult situations. And so Satoshi is working on creating different types of robots 
I would like to highlight this one here, um, really a more recent development. It is a robot that is more like a tentacle, can move forward into these uh, complicated spaces, as we can see here in these videos. And here's a close up of this um, new developments from his lab as a bristle like robot that can bring camera images back uh, to the remote viewer. In our work, we are now looking at a different type of robot. It's a so-called eversion robot. We can see it here on the right hand side, evolving from the tip like a plant when pressurized. And here, uh, a few more videos to show this kind of robot in action. As you can see, it is evolving, everting from the tip and then moving in this underground space under a building around the corners. And uh, we can not only make our robot move forward, but we can also control the bending and navigation. So to be able to reach um, the, the, yeah, the, the, the trap people in the buildings. And uh, we cannot only go there, uh, reach these people, but we can also deliver sensors like in this example, where a uh, camera is integrated. And once the robot has inverted sufficiently, we can use the camera feedback um, to understand what is happening in that remote area. I would like to thank my collaborators, as always, and also the sponsors. And of course, I would like to also thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Hello. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Kasper Althöfer and I'm the head of the Center for Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary, also called ARQ. And now I would like to give you an overview of our work on inflatable robots for human robot interaction and human robot cooperation in industry, but also in many other areas. Today, the standard robot manipulator looks like that, and it has a number of advantages. It's very useful to carry out a number, a range of manufacturing tasks. And as you can see, it can move very accurately to the various positions as required. However, there is now a great demand to move these robots out of their cages and to um, have robots that can interact with humans, can collaborate with them. And so one approach has been and is, is, has been used in a number of areas. It is the, let's say, perception software solution to human robot interaction. And we see here Sami Haddadin from the Technical University of Munich, who has programmed the robot to stop at the very moment that it is uh, colliding with his body. The idea is um, to use perception, so very similar to what I spoke about earlier, to have four sensors integrated into the robot and to use them to actually then control the robot when the collision is occurring. Another approach which uh, I find very interesting is the Sears Elastic Actuator developed by Gil Pratt and Matthew Williamson. And here we can see an overview of their approach. I don't want to go into the details, but one important point is that they have integrated a spring with their motor. So instead of connecting the motor straight to a robotic link, they have a spring in between to make it compliant, to make it soft and suitable for human robot interaction. And it has been actually realized in a industrial robot, so called the so-called Baxter. And if we zoom in here, we can see these two big springs there within the circle. Um, and these are now um, making the soft connection between two links. So I'm introducing here the serious elastic link, SEL. Sometimes we call it also the variable stiffness link because we cannot just have it soft, compliant um, at, at one setting as like the Baxter robot, but we can actually vary the stiffness over a wide range. And in this way, we create now something that can actually um, um, operate in a way that it allows us to adjust the stiffness, be compliant when required. So here you can see the, the robot arm in its fully inflated state, yeah, standard robot arm, but these links are now these SELs, um, series elastic uh, links. And if we now release the pressure, then we can see that the um, robot arm becomes soft and compliant. I would like to thank, uh, as always, my collaborators, and uh, our major sponsors. And thank you to you. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Lorenzo Iamone. I am a senior lecturer in robotics at the Queen Mary University of London. And in this video, I will tell you about the research we do in the area of cognitive robotics. I lead a team that goes under the name of CRISP, Cognitive Robotics and Intelligent Systems for the People. We have a twofold objective. We take inspiration from human intelligence to create smart robots that could help people in everyday tasks. But through this process, we also want to understand more about human intelligence. In particular, we focus on the intelligence of our hands, the extraordinary ability we have to use the hands to explore and understand the external environment, to grasp and manipulate objects, and even to communicate with each other. And in these research efforts, we are supported by several national and international funding bodies and companies. We use human-inspired strategies for the robot to grasp objects for which we do not have any prior information. We don't know where the objects are, what, what is their shape, if they are hard or soft, and we collect all this information in real time using both cameras and tactile sensors. We test different solutions on a large number of different objects, and we compare them against each other using statistical analysis so that we can really understand which solution works best and why. For applications in which we really want to make sure the grasp is stable, such as the robotic handling of delicate or dangerous items in hazardous environments, the robot performs haptic exploration before picking the object, to gather more information about the shape and stiffness of the object and to make sure the most precise and robust grasp is selected. For other applications, in which we require dexterous manipulation of the object after it is picked, we use the operation to teach manipulation actions to the robot. The human user can directly control the movement of the robot hand, and when the robot touches something, the tactile feedback is sent to the user using small vibrating motors placed on a wearable glove. After one manipulation action is demonstrated to the robot, for example, the translation of an object within the hand, the robot is able to reproduce this action in different conditions in the future, for example, using a different object, or making the translation longer or shorter. We are also investigating the role of hand movements in social interaction, also to understand how to make human-robot interaction more natural and effective. In one project, we look at how our hand movements change if we do not understand each other during a conversation. In another project, we investigate how moving our own hands, but also looking at someone else moving, helps us to understand musical rhythms and to synchronize with them. Thank you for the attention, and feel free to get in touch if you want to know more details. Hello everyone, my name is Lorenzo Iamone. I am a senior lecturer in robotics at the Queen Mary University of London. And in this video, I will tell you how can we give the sense of touch to robots. As humans, we can feel touch all over our skin, but especially on our hands and fingertips, which are the most sensitive body parts. Therefore, our sense of touch is particularly useful to successfully manipulate objects and to understand their physical properties. We feel touch thanks to different receptors in our skin. For example, Merkel's discs detect the amount of force applied to the skin on a contact point, and are therefore very important to regulate our grip strength when we manipulate objects. Hair follicles, on the other hand, detect any slight movement of our body hair and can therefore sense very light contacts. To provide the robots with a sense of touch, we have realized two families of tactile sensors taking inspiration from these receptors. A small magnet is immersed in a soft material and placed over a magnetic sensor that can measure the three-dimensional magnetic field generated by the magnet. When normal or shear forces are applied to the surface, the soft material is deformed, the magnet is displaced, and the magnetic field measured by the magnetic sensor changes, providing an indirect measure of the applied force. Because these sensors are so small, we can cover large and curved surfaces with a high density, like the fingers of this robot hand, which has more than 300 sensors in total. And because they are very sensitive, the robot can safely manipulate delicate objects, like the plastic cup you see in this video applying just the right amount of force not to damage it. In addition, we can also estimate object properties, such as size, stiffness and weight. For the cilia sensor, the soft material is filled with magnetic microparticles, whose magnetic fields are oriented along the same direction. 
Below, a tunnel magnetoresistance sensor measures the slight variation of magnetic field that occur when the seed is bent. This sensor is even smaller than the previous one and much more sensitive, as you can see in this video. Because of that, we can use it to finely characterize surfaces by tactile scanning and to collect information about their texture. For example, we use this to precisely measure the location and size of small apertures and grooves that we carved over a thin metallic sheet. In a different application, we were able to tell whether apples and strawberries were ripe or rotten with an accuracy of over 95%, just by gently touching them without provoking any damage or change to the fruit. Our research has been published and awarded in several international conferences and journals. Thank you for your attention and feel free to get in touch if you want to know more details. So we, we had actually one question related to the uh, first presentation of Caspar and that was about the application uh, of that. Um, I think you can either reply to that Caspar or if you want you can actually play the, your first video again because maybe the quality was bad and uh, actually the, the main messages didn't go through very well. I think we have a little bit of time and you can even play that again. Okay. Um, okay. If you want. <laughs> you, you're asking too much of me. Um, so yeah, let, let me remind me what, what was, what was I talking about in my first presentation? Um, what, which one was my first one? That was the one on, um, was it perception first? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we have um, many applications there. So generally, we are interested in interacting with the environment, and uh, um, my focus is uh, very much on tactile uh, interaction. So similar to what Lorenzo is doing. However, on my side, I use an optical approach to measure you know, interacting forces between a robot hand and, and the environment. And so we, we use this optical approach with quite some success. And the, the, the new step now is to um, create actually sensors that are also that are soft so that we can integrate them with soft robots. And there are loads of applications. So for example, we are developing soft prosthetics, so soft robotic hands that can be used as prosthetics. And then we want to integrate those sensors to measure the interaction with the environment. And through that, then give the user some information about that tactile interaction. But yeah, generally, many applications, generally the idea is to have now soft tactile sensors that can be integrated with soft robotic hands. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Kaspar. Uh, there is also a question for, uh, for me about, uh, uh, and I will answer this slide, um, how can the ripeness of the fruit be measured with tactile sensor? This relates to my presentation in which we are using this uh, cilia sensor to gently swipe over a fruit and collect some measurement and then classify those fruits as either ripe or rotten. And basically the information that we get with the, the sensor, uh, it's the vibration of this small cilia caused by the texture of the uh, external surface of the fruit. And also when we push with the cilia over the fruit, we collect information related to the softness or hardness of the fruit. And these two informations are important to determine whether a fruit is ripe or rotten. This will be something similar to what you can do by touching an apple and saying, okay, this looks good, or, well, this looks gone, right? So we, of course, we collected the data about uh, uh, ripe uh, apples and rotten apples, and, uh, and then we applied machine learning to classify whether they are ripe or rotten. But basically, this is similar to what you will do based on your previous experience by touching a fruit and feeling their softness and their texture and say whether they're ripe or rotten. So that's what we did. Okay, so I think uh, we don't have any more uh, question at this stage. So I will, um, I will ask Kasper if you can uh, go ahead and uh, share the other videos. Okay, I'm...
Hello, my name is Ilda Farkhardinov and I am a lecturer in robotics at Queen Mary University of London. I am also a leader at Human Augmentation and Generative Robotics team. I will talk about wearable robots to support human mobility. As you can see here, there are different types of robots to support human mobility and motor function. For example, robotic exoskeletons can assist with walking and augment human power. Together with colleagues from Imperial College London and the University of Twente, we have explored how exoskeletons can assist balancing during walking. We have studied the effects of robotic assistance for balance recovery after pelvis perturbation. We have validated our balance assistive controllers with healthy and post-stroke participants. We demonstrated that simple assistive control for hip abduction after a perturbation improves stability, reduces required efforts, and prevents falling. In the next project, we explore technology to motivate mobility and exercising among wheelchair users. Regular upper body exercising and mobility is crucial for health and social well-being of wheelchair users. However, very limited technology exists to support this function. Therefore, we address this problem with the colleagues from Sports and Exercise Center. We have instrumented a manual wheelchair with movement sensors that send the mobility measurements to a specially developed smartphone application. The smartphone application fused the data and provided mobility feedback and exercising recommendations. In future, we hope to develop a multi-user wheelchair mobility tracking and support system that will enable health and social care providers to observe health condition of people with physical disability and provide assistance when necessary. Finally, I would like to introduce our recent project we will explore posture ergonomics and balance support for supernumerary robotic limbs. This will be done in collaboration with industrial partners Shadow Robot, Okada Technology and Depth Ergonomics. If you would like to learn more about our projects, feel free to visit our website or email me. Thank you. Hello, in this presentation I will share with you my research on haptic interfaces. Haptic interfaces are used to provide touch feedback. For example, haptic feedback is commonly used in robot teleoperation, such that a human operator can feel what the remotely controlled robot touches. In my earlier research, I have developed new force feedback algorithms for mobile robot teleoperation. We proposed force feedback based on the obstacles surrounding the robot. We evaluated our force feedback method in a teleoperation task. It was demonstrated that the proposed velocity-dependent force feedback improved robot's motion control and reduced collisions. With my PhD student Joshua Brown, we develop a novel concept of vibration based on particle jamming. Combined vibration and jamming control enable stiffness, uh, simultaneous rendering of shapes, texture and softness. Such interfaces can provide human operator with information on physical robot environment interaction. This slide demonstrates haptic interfaces developed together with my colleagues at Imperial College. The interfaces are used to study human motor control. The interface shown on the left was used to measure lower limb joint dynamics. The interface shown on the right was used to explore neural correlates of arm control in fMRI studies. Finally, I would like to show how haptic interfaces can help people with sensory deficit. Deafblind people have absent or reduced vision and audition. Therefore, they rely on tactile sign language. Coffee. Here, thank you. How do you take it? I like it back. Good. 
deafblind people have other conditions. Therefore, they need dedicated therapies, for example, animal-based therapy. Through our collaboration with Shadow Robot Company, we met Riding for the Disabled Association, and we proposed to use wearable haptics to reduce the cost of their therapy. We have developed a dedicated haptic bands and a smartphone application for the rider and the instructor. We successfully deployed our system, which was well received by the rider, their family, and the therapist. It was possible to increase the frequency of the therapy sessions and reduce the cost. You are welcome to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ilda Farkardinov and I am a lecturer in robotics at Queen Mary University of London. I am also a leader for human augmentation and interactive robotics team. In this presentation, I will show how virtual reality based human machine interfaces can be used efficiently for tele robotics. Here you can see the concept of a virtual reality based teleoperation framework that we proposed within the UK National Project. National Center for Nuclear Robotics. The idea is to provide virtual input-output interface with interactive three-dimensional visualization, haptic feedback, and computer vision elements. My PhD student Buki Khan Omar Ali has implemented a virtual reality control interface to remotely operate a robotic manipulator. Visual feedback is provided as a three-dimensional point cloud obtained from depth cameras. The pores of the cameras installed on the robots can be manually and automatically adjusted by the human operator. This teleoperation interface was successfully applied to remote exploration and manipulation. Special awareness of the human operator is crucial for efficient robot control, especially in telerobotics. For example, on this photo it is hard to determine whether we are looking at ascending or descending staircase. Therefore, very often, visual-only modality is not sufficient. Terrain and special feedback is necessary. Together with my PhD student Atta Otaran, we have built a robotic ankle platform which can be used as an input-output interface to control virtual and remotely located robotic systems. Firstly, the platform is used to generate and control locomotion. Secondly, the platform generates terrain and slope feedback based on the robot environment physical interaction. Therefore, we can improve embodiment and immersiveness of the telepresence. This video demonstrates control of a virtual human-like robot with the help of developed walking platform and hand tracking. The platform uh, feet gesture movements are used to control the locomotion of the avatar, while hand movements are used to control the upper body. We plan to test the developed interface in teleoperation of different types of legged robotic systems. Please visit our website or feel free to email me if you have any questions. Thank you. I'm Angad Nanjangud, a lecturer in spacecraft engineering in SEMS and also a member of the ARQ. My talk today is on the technologies in robotics that can be used for constructing large structures in orbit one day. And the image over here shows the construction of large habitats. However, the need for space construction is motivated from something slightly different in the sense that we have a picture over here showing us the different rockets or launch vehicles that have been used and will be used in the future. And you can see that over here we have the space launch system, which has a fairing diameter of 8.4 meters, the diameter being the X length, you could say, or the X axis over here. Now, what we really want to put up in space at present are large space telescopes, which are used both for Earth observation and astronomy. Over here in gold, we have the James Webb Space Telescope, which has a diameter or an aperture, more formally, of 6.5 meters, which you can see wouldn't fit in any of the vehicles today, but it might fit in ones in the future. But if we want to build the 16 meter te telescope, it's not gonna fit monolithically or as one unit inside this space launch system. We do want to build bigger telescopes because they offer better images, but we need a different paradigm, which involves packing it up and assembling it in space after launch. 
And that's what this new paradigm is about, IKEAfication, launching and building in space. That's why we need space construction to achieve these large structures. So how can we go about building this kind of structure? Well, it can be done in two steps. So the first one is mission planning and analysis. Over here, we begin by identifying what kind of telescope needs to be built. And in my work with Airbus and SSTL, who are two industry giants in the UK, we've looked at a 25 meter Earth observation telescope. We've also considered who should be assembling this? Should it be an astronaut or should it be a robot? And it turns out robots are just cheaper, faster, safer. You know, we don't have to put humans li human lives at risk for something like this, and therefore they're better. So we've developed a whole launch plan and we've presented this at a conference, uh, both at uh, the European Space Agency and elsewhere in America. And this is what it boils down to. It's a four launch system. We use a robot, just a single one that can go about assembling the system. So the demonstration of the assembly in space of this 25 meter space telescope also requires another demonstration, which is that of a space robot. Now this leads into step two, which is the space robot technology development that needs to be done. This walking robotic mission actually serves as the bridge between what can be developed on the ground, which is the focus of my group, and to what can actually be done in space. And within my group, we're gonna work on developing the space robotic hardware that sort of emulates what the real uh, mission will do eventually. And all of this hardware will sit upon a software stack, which has the capacity to both demonstrate the dynamics and the autonomous control needed for these systems. The dynamics involves both multi-body related aspects, such as flexibility, rigidity, and mass variation, as well as the contact dynamics that come from manipulation and interaction between both the spacecraft and the robot with themselves, as well as with the environment. This is the focus of work that's going to be done in my group in the coming year. Hello, everyone. I'm Kato Zhang, currently a lecturer in robotics, and I'm leading the robotic systems group within the Center for Advanced Robotics. There are mainly four research themes in my group, including robot kinematics and dynamics, which are the fundamental basis for modeling and control of any robotic systems. With effective tools powered by the advances in theory of engineer and material science, we explore new designs of robot manipulators, movable soft-bodied robots, and biorobotics. Within biorobotics, we particularly focus on bio-inspired locomotion and multi-agent system. In our previous work, we investigated biological landing mechanisms and explored the landing methods. Taking the biological landing techniques of the animal flyers as a resource of inspiration, we abstract key functions of different types of legs and sensory systems to inform the design of landing mechanisms for small robots such as port rotor UAVs. In parallel to the research inspired by animal flyers, we also explore the behavior exhibited by fast running animals, in particular cheetah and ostrich. From the video here, you can observe that cheetah neck structure is characterized by a long foot that acts like a lever mechanism. During running, the entire foot is dorsiflected when in contact with terrain to provide a high propulsion force. To pushing forward the state of the art of legged mobile robots, our group particularly focuses on bio-inspired solutions that aims to mimic leg design, rich velocity and the dexterity performance of running animals. The major challenge for developing leg -like mobile robots is represented by the complexity in design and the manufacture of leg -like components and by energy efficiency of the system. The video here shows our recent work on novel leg mechanisms design and simulation. Here, I would also like to mention that we recently secured EPSSA core equipment fund, which allows us to build a state-of-the-art robot testing arena. This will boost our research, particularly in robotics and AI. Thank you. Okay, so this concludes our uh, presentations. Uh, sorry again for the technical difficulties in the beginning. I think the second uh, the session went much better in that sense, hopefully, so you could uh, enjoy the presentations. We, I believe we have a few questions there. So a question for Kaspar and myself. Uh, 
Uh, do you foresee combining the magnetic and optical based sensors to provide different, better sensitivity? Is it possible? Will there be any benefit? Um, I will leave it to Kaspar to answer first, uh, but I can also add something. Good, good, good. No, I, th I think it's an interesting question. Um, I have not really thought about that possibility um, because the, 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 the two sense or the two types of sensors that we are working on, Lorenzo and I, are um, very much doing the same thing. So, but I suppose, I mean, it would be, of course, very nice to uh, continue collaborating with Lorenzo also on, on that topic. And, um, and maybe there are possibilities of maybe observing the cilia using, um, using the whole effect sensor, but at the same time using an optical approach. Um, I, I'm, we would need to think about what the advantages yeah, are that could come out of that. But yeah, interesting, definitely. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I don't have much to add. I think uh, uh, one uh, interesting difference is that, of course, the optical sensor, they don't need to bring electronics uh, on the top of the, of the sensor, so they're more suited for certain applications, while the magnetic sensors might be a bit more uh, robust and sensitive in the measurements, so they might be optimal for other situations. So, of course, the integration could be probably interesting and possible, but mostly at, at the moment, I think we see that as two similar sensors, but that are best in different applications or in different uh, application scenarios. But uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so we have, um, uh, so another general question for Angu, uh, what, what are the biggest challenges with operating robotics in space? Of course, this is a big question, I guess, but Angu, if you want to give a, a, a quick answer uh, of what you think are the biggest challenges. So I think there are plenty of them. One is when we talk about space robotics, there are two domains. So there is uh, microgravity-based robotics and there's planetary robotics. So I'll talk a little bit about what we've achieved so far in terms of uh, microgravity-based robotics, because I don't really dive into uh, planetary robotics as much. But one of the common challenges is that you have high radiation environments when you're sending missions into space. So the kinds of processes that you have to use have to be space hardened. And that's why what we end up using in space is still something like 20 years in the past. So that's one of the common sort of bottlenecks in terms of what we see, which is why you see a lot of uh, space engineers shunning the use of you know, these new neural networks uh, based techniques because you can't really send those processes up into space today. But that is going to change in the future. It just has to, that's just the nature of technology in itself, which is why there is a bigger push being made for the use of autonomous robots in space. We haven't really done much in that area, even though you have, okay, maybe you have like rendezvous and docking and things like that where two spacecraft come together. But when you think about multi-body systems like the Canadarm, which is the space crane on the ISS, that stuff is uh, mostly controlled by astronauts or from the ground by uh, teleoperators. So the introduction of autonomy is restricted, not just because we don't know how to like maybe implement it on existing computing hardware uh, in space, but it also comes from the fact that there are regulations in space uh, in terms of like debris that gets generated and the amount of testing that needs to be done before you can sort of deploy a fully autonomous system. So this is, I would say, maybe two of the key points uh, on that front. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Angu, for the, for the answer. Uh, there is another question uh, for Kaspar, I will say. Uh, apart from uh, search and rescue, what could be other applications of the version robots you are developing? Yeah, thank you very much. That is also a very good question. And um, on a very general note, on, I mean, wherever we have inaccessible spaces, wherever we need to you know, penetrate into a very restricted space, this kind of robot can be applied. And um, that's, that's where this type of robot, the version robot, um, is, is very different from standard robots because it extends from the tip. So it moves forward in a frictionless way. And that is, I think, very useful, especially if you want to, you know, get into some remote space. Um, before I completely answer the question, I should also mention something I didn't do during my talk, that there uh, is Elliot Hawks and there is uh, Alison Okamura, and they both have worked quite a bit on 
um, immersion robots, so you should have a look at their work as well. Anyway, looking at applications, there are actually many applications. So we are working with a company here in, uh, in London, Qbot, and try to create now devices that can go under buildings to inspect buildings um, and apply thermal insulation. Another area is the nuclear industry. Here we are working together with, uh, with the nuclear industry in the framework of the National Center for Nuclear Robotics and try to create now robots again that can penetrate in these areas, um, very, um, very high, highly radioactive areas, so humans cannot go there to carry out um, various tasks. And maybe I can add a third area, it's the medical field. So here we are looking at colonoscopy as an example. And again, we see that type of robot as very useful because we can move in the colon in this case, um, forward into this very restrict, no, very difficult to access space and can do it in a frictionless way. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspar. Um, okay, so let me see over on the question. So to Angu, uh, why is it cheaper to use robots to build space structures than astronauts? It's an interesting question. So one of, I, I would say there are two sides to it. One has to do with the training that you need to provide astronauts on the ground. So creating training facilities that sort of emulate microgravity and, you know, putting astronauts there, buying astronaut time, training them up on the ground is one challenge. And then the other challenge is once you put astronauts up in space, I think if you uh, look up the uh, information on NASA's website, I think they spend something like 30% of their time finding uh, misplaced tools and things like that. So, you know, it's like bookkeeping is not really one of the main things that astronauts are really good at. And then you have to worry about exercise equipment and all of that stuff that needs to be provided to astronauts as well. And then there is the fact that when they do external walks, there is just, I mean, the value of a life can't even be quantified at that point. Whereas if you were to put a robot out that that was autonomous or even teleoperate from the ground, it's a whole different ball game. And you can send more of these up there and de-risk the technology and probably, you know, deploy them in a larger scale than we've sent astronauts up. We've sent maybe 250 astronauts, or maybe 300 astronauts up to the ISS in the last 20, 22 years. You could probably send more space robots up there for a much lesser cost, a fraction. Okay, thank you, very interesting. Uh, okay, we have another question for, I believe it's for Ildar. Uh, in the VR teleoperation, what feedback is provided to the user, uh, vision, uh, visual, haptic, uh, and what are the main applications? Okay, and I want to add a comment uh, about the space robotics. Uh, so, uh, the reason why uh, robots are better than humans in space, because uh, robots can stay there for many years, even for decades, but humans maybe several months is already difficult not to go to extreme and about virtual reality so uh, first uh, applications uh, i'm looking into uh, related to tele robotics for example we want to control a robot uh, in space and we need to provide as much uh, useful information to a human operator back on earth uh, with uh, feedback and number one feedback is of course visual for virtual reality uh, traditionally and uh, that is what our brain is used to but if we smartly use haptic touch feedback and uh, we uh, use uh, variable systems which can affect uh, full body haptics then we can uh, augment uh, human operator with additional uh, information to improve the system control and safety that's it okay. thank you very much uh, another one which i think is also for you uh, I, how will exoskeleton be powered uh, wirelessly without being too heavy? Yeah, let me think about this question. I'm trying to understand it. Uh, so wirelessly, normally exoskeletons, yeah, exoskeletons are supposed to be autonomous. So they carry all required electronics, actuation and power. Uh, next to the human uh, so it should be embedded system and uh, otherwise it will be not fully mobile now 
the second part was uh, what was it uh, about the weight basically the whether weight. it will impact on the weight of ah, the yeah and of course it uh, uh, normally the heaviest parts are actuation and power batteries so this uh, is uh, an interesting research question where we should uh, put them next to a center of mass of human or next to the ground on the feet. Uh, there are different approaches on the market uh, because they will affect either mobility or stability of the system. And uh, related to wireless control comment. Uh, yeah, uh, even though the system is fully autonomous and carry all uh, required electronics on board, uh, they can still use uh, wireless communication modules to send certain data. It depends on the application to a a cloud uh, computer for example and big uh, uh, development field currently is iot for uh, for robotics iot for medical robotics so for medical devices uh, internet of things how these devices are connected together yeah that's it okay thank you very much um so um i think we 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 arrive to the end of this webinar uh, ideally, we can stay up for a few more minutes if there were more questions. So if anyone has uh, any last minute question or uh, any more curiosity, please keep uh, typing them on the Q&A. We may answer a few more. Uh, but uh, because it's, the, it's, now, um, it's now 12 and we were supposed to finish at 12, let me first uh, thank all the attendees to, to join us and uh, uh, asking all these questions and making this more lively and interesting. Thank you very much for for coming and hopefully this was interesting for you. Of course, uh, uh, you see now uh, in the chat a few links about uh, our uh, uh, web pages and Facebook. Uh, so if you want to have more information and follow our activities, please uh, do check those sources. And, uh, of course, you're also very welcome to contact us uh, individually. Uh, if you Google our names, you will probably find all the information you, you need.